seeking the uncomfortable. I remember when I was 22, I definitely took probably more risks than the average. I don't know, maybe I'm being a little bit too full of myself, but I think I was, but I certainly was also a little bit more risk adverse. And over time, as you grow older, you realize like it's totally healthy to fall. It's totally healthy to make mistakes. Quick overview on, on what the Creator Fund is. It's really trying to bootstrap the ecosystem, the NFT ecosystem with an avalanche and really trying to spur excitement around it, simply put. Now, to get a little bit deeper than that, we're partnering with an amazing project called Open. OP3N is, is how you would spell it. And Open is um, co-founded by a friend, Jason Ma. He um, comes from a music background, has a lot of experience in basically the Hollywood entertainment scene. And he identified this, this opportunity with NFTs where he was saying, well, NFTs, we could just use this as membership passes. You have all these different musicians and, and celebrities who are probably just outside the musician rung. So whether they're content creators or things like that, I think that they count as well. But mm -hmm. all these people of influence want to use this technology and want to get in on it. I think the problem with the last two years is with the Trojan horse example, people almost got a little bit too excited when they first saw the Trojan horse. They're saying like, oh, wow, this is so great. Like, this is exactly what I wanted. And those are kind of the PFP drops, I would say. It's like you you kind of saw the shiny sticker, but you didn't really take a look mm -hmm. at the rest of the, the landscape, seeing that there's so much more out there. And and so I think utility is always kind of the, the Web3 meme, right? Everyone's always saying like, oh, yeah, well, right now, like crypto is very um, kind of like is cannibalistic where it just like <laughs> interacts with each other. But once we find that utility, it's going to be great. And I think we're inching towards that with a few different verticals, with NFTs, similar way. So the membership passes this idea of, well, what happens if you have, and taking Jason's words too, what happens if you have uh, an artist, let's say like, um, uh, like Justin Bieber? Justin Bieber has all of the complexities with publishers, music, labels. It's basically a convoluted company at, at a certain degree. But what would be amazing is if you could then empower the artist to be able to talk to the fans more directly, but also make sure that the two-way street with the artist is much more seamless. So the, the fans also really get the value. And so the idea was like, let's create a system that enables anyone to be Willy Wonka and everyone can create their own chocolate factory. This is legitimately like a verbatim quote of what Jason said. And it, it actually cool. is a great... Yeah, great, great analogy. I, I, because then you now have, let's say you have like a $5 NFT. Those fans can have access to digital channels and, and maybe just like loose touch points where it's not too, too intimate. But if you keep mm -hmm. going up and up and rung, like let's say you pay $10,000, maybe you could get backstage passes once a year to a Justin Bieber concert. And so now you have this interesting market that's created because you now have these assets that can be, again, tradable with anything that's on chain. So you could trade these Justin Bieber backstage tickets for maybe um, like a DeFi protocol, to like a bag of B DeFi protocol tokens. That to me is so interesting of an application because now you're able to create value with other markets that didn't that didn't exist before because the interoperability, if you will, wasn't there. Um, mm -hmm. So Open, I think the last thing I'll say about Open is they're making sure that they can make the user experience as easy as possible without dealing with the blockchain complexities not trying to deal with the annoyances of like private key management, um, the terms that we all kind of take for granted at this point, I think, because we, we all know them pretty well. But for someone that's coming in, maybe like a Justin Bieber fan who has no idea what crypto is, has no idea what Bitcoin is, but just wants to have that experience with that artist, mm -hmm. they can go into open, buy a pass, nicely designed. You could also extend that experience to other anything that can be uploaded on chain. So whether it's like a mini clip of a music video or, or any of the exclusive content. So now you, now the way I see NFTs too, is it's it's another marketing channel. For better or for worse, I definitely won't comment on that too much as, as like I have a huge bias on, on being a marketer, but I think it's a really fascinating way to interact with your consumers. And that's where the $100 million incentive program is to incentivize those artists to come on Avalanche and try and experiment and see if they can deploy something amazing um, for their fans effectively. And, and we have many more different initiatives 
that are in the pipeline that aren't public yet, but we are trying to just continue to sprint through these lanes because there's so much opportunity. It would be a, a bit of a shame if we left it all on the table. Yeah, absolutely. So two questions follow up with that. Um, how would um, anyone, for example, audience listening out there, maybe they are a creator themselves. How could they get you know involved with um, this 100 million creator fund? Do they apply somewhere or um, something like that? The creator fund is um, would go through open. So it's kind of, I think, pretty sure there's an application process. Um, I, there was a blog post on it. Uh, maybe we can put it in the show notes or something. It should be okay. on there. Absolutely. Love and to. that's um, that's where the teams, both Avalanche and, and um, open teams, are going to evaluate the opportunities and figure out which ones make sense to push forward. And like actually okay. today, um, let me see. I'll send it to you later. But today, Ava Max, a, a vocalist, she released a music video, which was kind of step one of many through that open incentive program. And the music video has like avalanche, like scattered throughout oh. it. It's kind of this fun, like pop, oh. pop track. Well, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really um, think like music and FTH is something that's so super, super exciting. Um, like personally for me, have you had any specific thoughts or comment on that maybe potential? Oh yeah, music NFTs are fascinating. I fascinating in the sense that it's a complex problem. I don't think anyone's quite solved it yet in terms of actual music, not like uh, like the fan membership token that I was just describing. Like I think that's that's that was a low hanging fruit and and, and um, maybe not easy, but a little bit more straightforward to solve or at least try to implement. With music, I think this is. I have a background in music before Web three. I think I told you this, so that's that's why I have a huge passion for thinking through how this works. Um, and how you could actually make it successful. The biggest issue with music right now is the market, not Web3 music, but just music in general. The market has trained the user or the consumer, all of us included, to basically pay little to no money for, for music. You have streaming software, which pays a monthly membership, which is, by the way, the outlier. Most of the world isn't paying a Spotify premium membership monthly. Most of the, the privileged areas like uh, major cities and things like that are certainly paying for it but the rest of the world is not and so when you look at consumer behavior they're using youtube to stream they're consuming the ads they might be even using spotify for free not even paying for the mm -hmm. premium version and so to to match the same behavior with nft collectibles like non-music collectibles and music doesn't quite work because art you've trained a certain group of people to pay a reasonable amount of money to acquire that that uh, piece or that creative output, uh, usually like a visual piece, whether it's photography, uh, painting or, or whatnot, right? With music, all of a sudden, if you go, hey, by the way, I have 500 unique tracks and you can own a part of it and you can then pay, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. Like, what does that actually mean? Because the legality still hasn't been totally ironed out either. There's many instances where the publishers or the music labels, they end up suing the artist that launches these NFTs. And so there's mm -hmm. clearly this gray area where I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think these NFTs that are minted have, hold, would hold in court as, as kind of a, from a legal perspective, I guess. And so as I'm kind of highlighting the problem statement, I don't necessarily have a solution, but this is something that I, I definitely talk about more openly, like usually, usually behind closed doors, not trying to like create too many stances, but I think it's an interesting topic to talk about. Whoever figures it out is going to really figure out, I think, either the legal route where there can actually be um, rights integrated on chain somehow, where all of a sudden you do actually have true ownership of the song, whatever that may be. I think that's an interesting but very challenging route. The other one is maybe there's a way to create streaming platforms where all of the data of streaming and all of the, the payment rails are settled using blockchain technology, which just makes it more efficient and making sure that all of the the um, like the fee structures, how how the artist makes money, the label makes money, all of that is transparent. That doesn't necessarily solve for the issue of the artist not getting anything, but at least I think that's a step one to make sure that everything is out there in the public. So it's not just this kind of convoluted um, mark, private market of contracts where no one knows how these how these labels and artists are making money. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, as you mentioned, Riley, the bigger thing is that um, 
the music label or Spotify, they are making money, or especially the music label, they're making make way too much money, and then what they left for a majority of artists just like uh, essential background, right? And then that is definitely the biggest issue. And I read this somewhere. It is not maybe not necessarily applying to the musicians or artists that signed to the label already, but maybe for the independent artists, there were those people who are starting, right? They can essentially using NFTs or music NFTs in a way as for if and when the early supporter, they are purchasing these NFT and they could essentially set up in a way that thank you for supporting me now in this moment. And then later when I get bigger, uh, this NFT will uh, be a certificate as later on when this artist making more money will be able to share a percentage of his or her earning with the early NFT or early supporters. I read this somewhere. Um, yeah, like I an investment. That that's, the, the, yeah. that's kind of like the social token model that sector is, is really popularizing that, that idea. I think it's, it, it ties nicely into that membership token example. If you found Justin Bieber when he was straight out of YouTube and you bought, you know, like a backstage pass membership or even, you know, you bought like a membership that like somehow got, uh, had some sort of right. valuation on it, you would be super wealthy if you pay, if you held on to that for this entire time. And props to you maybe because you were able to fund his career um, or maybe not the entire career, but you were able to fund one portion yeah. of his career and you were early to that market. And then you were able to then have conviction in that talent and making sure that you're not putting sell pressure, I guess, on that market and then making sure that you're propping up that entity. And then eventually if you wanted to flip it, you could. And I think that that's a certainly a, vi a reasonable way to to use this stuff. I think it, it's, it's very simple too. It's nothing crazy, yeah. um, but it's basically like making everything into stocks. Yeah. Yeah. Is uh, essentially. And also on the note, uh, Cyber Relic, I know a DAO that they are doing something a little bit similar uh, in this in this way, they're a little bit similar, which is this DAO is incubating sustainable fashion brands, right? And then they work together and creating, helping this fashion brand creating NFTs and promote them. And then when the users or fans are purchasing the NFT and obviously some of the NFT different prices, maybe the cheaper one come with the t-shirts or the jackets and however, the more expensive one, they will be able to use this NFT as essentially like we talked about earlier as a ticket to their fashion show or for example, in Milan or in LA or in New York. And I just, when you're when we're having this conversation, just, just pop in my head, I found that super interesting. It's not exactly music or art, but also like, you know, fashion as well. That is, you know, it's just like right there, right next to it. With so. fashion, too, the the other really cool implementation is more so on the consumer transparency perspective, but also, again, marketing. It's really leaning into marketing, but brand storytelling perspective. Imagine if you had, and it, it really works, I think it works for any type of brand, even the mass market brands like, like Zara's and H&M's and things like that. But you can have these NFTs basically minted. And imagine if you, let's pick a, let's pick like more of a boutique or like a, high-end brand and you can say like let's say like saint laurent or something you have these people that love the brand and what the brand has stood for for arguably like decades or even centuries um long it has a lot of value that's added to this this exact label now what is happening in the fashion market is counterfeits really minimize that brand value because all of a sudden now you could buy a bootleg saint laurent hoodie and who knows what <laughs> who made that, I guess, effectively, who knows where that comes yeah. from. And so you're diluting the market a little bit. So with NFTs, what's cool is my friend Calvin Chan, he, he founded this company called Legitimate. Legitimate actually tackles this exact problem, which is why I think it's such an interesting solution or an uh, interesting project rather. And what he's doing, he's saying, well, we can create these NFTs to make sure that if you buy a Saint Laurent hoodie, you get an NFT. And so if you buy a counterfeit one and you don't get the original minted NFTs, you just have a fake one. Simply put, it doesn't matter which way you put it. You can't fake it till you make it. Um, it's just the way it is, right? The other thing with the marketing angle is not only can you prevent counterfeit, but you can also, again, tell that story. So imagine if you set, you you bought a hoodie and you, you scanned it and it says, by the way, this hoodie is unit six out of like 6,000. It also is made out of all of these different materials. It's sourced from here, 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 and here because all of it was tracked during the actual on-chain minting process, I guess. Um, this part of the, you know, this part I think has to, has a little bit of work to go, I think, because it's like, you know, you just put yeah. information on there, but still pretty cool. 
And then yeah. I think the other part is really like, maybe you could create digital experiences. Maybe you could attach like a runway clip um, that's a collectible. So not only are you collecting the physical item, but you also have a stake in the digital realm. And and from someone who, I'm personally, I'm super into fashion and, and I'm sure anyone who's buying these brands are also relatively in, into it enough, right? They're spending significant amounts of money on, on clothes. And so what's cool about that is you're already a collector. It's kind of like the idea of trying to sell NFTs to a Beanie Baby fanatic or a Pokemon fanatic. It's like not that hard of a sell because you already know what it's like to try and be a collector for almost like plain and simple, almost like no reason, except for the idea of this brand existing. Um, so I think that's also really cool. Like uh, Alexander McQueen also did an implementation through their MCQ label where they literally have the NFT RFC chip in their sleeve. Like I have a hoodie by them and you can't take it out and you literally can scan it next to your phone. And the, the execution is like not a plus. It's like kind of like a, it's like a decent execution, honestly, but the right. idea is there where I think we can continue to improve on that model. And imagine if collect real collectors, I don't think everyone's going to do it. I, I think most people really don't care. Um, but for some people that do care, maybe they'll be like, Oh, like, that's cool. What can, can I learn about that piece? And they just put their phone next to your friend's hoodie and they see that it's like six out of a hundred and all the information that you know of. And I think that's, uh, a really cool application of NFTs with with um, fashion. Oh yeah, absolutely. I really think so. That's um, just super super interesting. And okay, next question. Although I totally, I just feel like I had the feeling that me and you could just talk about NFT and fashion for like forty five minutes. You know, I'm you know <laughs> yeah. super respectful for your time. We'll have to do that for the next episode. Uh, you know, Jay. Rapid fire on um, his, you know, J Rapid fire on NFT and fashion, you know, we'll definitely <laughs> yeah. <gonna> do that. <laughs> Sounds good. So, yeah, please, uh, young listeners out there, or for the younger version of ourselves, Jay, what advice would you give it to your 22 year old self right now? <laughs> the advice, 22 hmm, year old self, I think the advice is maybe continue seeking the uncomfortable. I remember when I was 22, I definitely took probably more risks than the average. I don't know, maybe I'm being a little bit too full of myself, but I think I was. But I certainly was also a little bit more risk adverse. And over time, as you grow older, you realize like it's totally healthy to fall. It's totally healthy to make mistakes. Um, it's actually quite empowering if you're able to make those mistakes and you don't have any slip ups because of it and you're not super depressed for however long it may be, right? And so I think it's just a, it's it's like the, Ray Dalio says it a lot too. He's like, these markets are cyclic, uh, or follow cycles. Like they mm -hmm. have booms and they have busts. Your, yeah. your human emotions have booms, but they also certainly need busts. You can't just always have booms. And hmm. I think that's, that's the advice that I'd say to, to myself when I was 22, but also anyone else um, who's, who's worried about you know, making, making mistakes, being embarrassed. Um, you're going to be embarrassed. You're going to be sad. You're going to be all the negative emotions that you could pro possibly imagine. But as you continue and, and fall many times by the, by the time you're doing it, the thousandth time is really not going to be, be a big deal and almost probably going to turn into an amazing moment where you might laugh about it. Um, and I think that's a super healthy way to look at things. Yes, absolutely. Super, super great. Um, I really think that. This quote that I read long, long time ago when I first moved to America, when I was 18, I saw this quote and then just been thinking about this ever since, um, which is like the life, your life begins when you're stepping outside your comfort zone, which is, you know, like, don't be afraid to take a risk and, and go after what you are passionate about, right? So uh, the next question, which is one of the last questions I promise here, um, is that I think this is something that a lot of people in the crypto industry are going through this right now and it will be truly great. It will, it will shine some light on this, which is, you know, uh, something a little bit related with work-life balance, right? Because we all work like so much as 24 seven, right? Jay, do you have any uh, tips or advice when it comes to re romantic relationship? Because I know that you got so much things going on that you have, you know, so much responsibility. How do you, how do you balance that? <laughs> Just, <laughs> I think, uh, uh... I don't know. There's certainly a million ways to do this, but my way, I don't even think I'm doing it too, super well either, but I think it's really about like having self-respect first and foremost, making sure that you really know who you are, um, not letting that slip up. I think the reason why I say that, especially in the context of Web3 is there's a lot of money being made. There's a lot of money being moved around. There's also plenty of money being lost as well, but for the most part, it's not 
everything's not about money. In fact, almost nothing is about money. Money is just an implementation that was made by human beings, but it doesn't really change your emotional well-being or your relationships for that matter. I mean, certainly you can probably get a partner through waving money around, but do you really want to, to have that be the reason why you're connecting with people? Personally, I don't. Um, and so I think really understanding who you are uh, as an individual, like I remember the last, probably like right after school, uh, right after college, um, I definitely took a lot of time just kind of like soul searching, not with anybody else, but just for myself. Like, who am I as an individual? What is something that makes me happy? What's also something that makes me sad? And once you're really comfortable with yourself, similarly to what I said with um, with kind of the, uh, the 22 year old advice comment is, you can roll with the punches so much more easily. And I think it, your true self also shines through with whoever your uh, prospective partners may be. And that way, at least you'll tra stay hopefully as grounded as possible without any of the craziness of Web3 really taking you aside. And, and I think I also say that coming from seeing a lot of people in the industry uh, maybe get a little bit taken away from some of the, the craziness of our space. And you're kind of like, how does this happen? And you're like, oh, I know. Well, your ego is super fragile. Now, if you make you know millions of dollars overnight or, or over a, a tiny span of time, your ego gets padded by all this stuff that isn't super healthy. And all of a sudden, there's going to be a point where it's like almost impossible to break out of that shell. And, and it's not super healthy to, to think that you're the center of the world, I think. Um, everyone has an ego. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not trying to say yeah. don't have an ego. Like, it's almost impossible to not have an ego. But it's almost, I guess, the recommendation is to make sure that it's healthy as possible and actively maintain it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a book uh, written by Ryan Holiday. It's called Ego is the Enemy. Uh, I found that uh, title and also the content quite interesting. Also, I been also constantly reflecting upon myself and when I'm talking to, you know, uh, other amazing guests like you, right? Which is one thing that I realize is that, like, we should really be aware about who we are as a soul or as an individual in this lifetime versus what we have accomplished or what we our company or our team have accomplished right so they're like almost like uh in meditation call like you take a step back and you're observing like this is why yeah this is what i have done right and then so that is like kind of so that when things go to the moon or you know totally go to shit that your well-being doesn't necessarily take that insane roller coaster with it so i think that's like personally super helpful for me always any call to action that you would like to make to the audience out there if you if you're interested in avalanche check it out avax.network is the website there's plenty of information there if you have any questions um and you're tuning in all the way at the end and, and you want to know something that i might have the answer to um feel free to reach out i'll try and check the dms as much as possible and, and be responsive jayks17 on twitter um, is a good place to find me Amazing, amazing. And by the way, guys, Jay, uh, his Twitter is like super cool, super awesome. He have, I think, very long time ago, you have this uh, thread about advice, right, about like getting jobs or getting into the industry. I yeah. really love that one. So much good content. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. man. I appreciate well, it. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate your time. Um, I know you're super busy. Guys, stay tuned. I promise going to have Jay back here. We're going to talk about NFT and music. Well, thank you so much for today's time and appreciate you. And yeah, holler at you soon, brother. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks for having me.